Guys, welcome back to a uh, series number two on our technical e-learning series. Uh, again, I'm Matt Young with Floco, and today we have another guest host, uh, Brandon Dobbs, Director of Gas Lift. Hello. Yeah, thanks for being here, Brandon. Yes, sir. Yeah, thanks for uh, taking the drive down from Fort Worth to come talk about Gas Lift today. Yeah, it's not a bad drive. <laughs> oh, that, that's good. Hopefully the weather was pretty good for you. But uh, guys, today is going to be our kickoff of our first technical series, uh, Series 2, Gas Lift 101. Um, really want to take this uh, this training course um, to really dive into just what gas lift is, you know, how you can lower your flow and bottom hull pressure, how it's used as artificial lift, um, go into equipment selections. Uh, definitely want to get your opinion on what you see from the different basins, Brandon, on uh, equipment used how they're applying that equipment and really how they're getting, um, you know, draw down and, and getting the production they want out of it. So, um, yeah, with that, let's go into overview and uh, talk about a couple things before we get really into our training. So, again, first technical series of the, uh, the year. Um, we had one with Charlie Jones uh, last month. It was more just overview, market expectations, things like that. And so now we're kind of diving into the actual technical, the nuts and bolts of um, artificial lift, uh, be it uh, gas lift or plunger lift, capillary tubing. And so, of course, today, really just want to talk about gas lift, get your expert opinion and, and feedback on what you see in the different basins um, when it comes to gas lift. And so with that, we'll talk about the equipment, kind of get everybody warmed up on that, what equipment's out there. Um, what operators do, are doing in some of the different basins and how they're, um, you know, of course, using that equipment. Um, and then really want to transition from there into the design, what you see with designs, um, how the designs are utilized. And, of course, for anybody that's unfamiliar, the designs, the, the engineering piece before the equipment actually gets installed in the ground. So that helps us do things like what model flow and bottom hole pressure, um, so we can ex, uh, you know, determine and expect production, um, helps us understand where mandrels are going to be placed or where our lift points are going to be, um, things like that. So we'll get into that um, in the, the presentation piece. And of course, we got Brandon here um, to really give us some good feedback on, you know, what you're seeing in the basins, equipment, uh, design parameters, some of the things that you see and and prefer when you're actually working on a gas lift system with an operator. Yeah, for sure. I mean, definitely uh, as a group, collectively, we've all got a lot of experience and, you know, a lot of different basins, a lot of different uh, plays. Um, I think what's unique probably about you and I is the timing that we came into, you know, this space was, uh, you know, kind of a, what I like a, like a lot of you know new concepts were evolving mm -hmm. at that time and, yeah. and uh, uh, especially with the uh, you know horizontal and conventional plays that that you and I have uh, have most of our experience in I I enjoy talking you know with more senior guys in our group that obviously have that uh, offshore experience mm -hmm. um, but uh, but yeah we've definitely have been around long enough that we kind of have a we're kind of in that like, kind of in middle, that middle Brandon? well we're kind of in that middle group like you know we got gray hair or i do you don't I, i'm just balding <laughs> instead your my hair's turning gray your hair's falling out yeah, but, that's right um a lot of it's probably you know due to the stress of the, <laughs> the job that we we do on a daily basis but it, it's a lot of fun and, and it's you know for me personally it's been uh it's been very rewarding it's uh a, uh, it's been a great you know great ride so far and and hey we're only you know maybe halfway, halfway there halfway there so That's we got right. a long ways to go yeah yeah definitely so yeah definitely want to get that feedback that uh, experience that you have in uh, applications primarily equipment selection really how how we're using gas lift um, to help dewater or maintain production on these unconventionals and you know we'll look at a, a wide gamut from like you mentioned uh, a dewatering gas well in the barnet to a uh, prolific uh, oil producer say in the delaware basin and, and really look at those different applications and um, of course for all these trainings guys we're going to record them 
Um, we'll post them up on the uh, Floco website under the artificial lift training. So if anybody missed, if anybody has to get off early, um, if anybody comes in late, they can always go and see this uh, presentation um, recorded on our website. So typically we'll get that uh, uploaded like a day or two um, after this. They edit it a little bit and do all the uh, behind the scenes stuff. But I don't know how they do it. I just know it gets on the internet. Um, so we'll be able to see that and uh, have that posted hopefully by uh, Friday or if not Monday uh, of next week. So maybe the folks that are on spring break next week, if they want to take a break, they can jump on and watch a recording that we did this week. Yeah, I won't be watching this while I'm on spring break. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing for spring break? Uh, we're going we're going up to the mountains next week. So all right, do some skiing. Yeah, I don't know how much skiing we'll do. We'll do some playing in the snow. Oh, there you go. Yeah. You know, skiing hurts my hurts my knees and <laughs> everything else these days. <laughs> oh, I bet so. Uh, for one day of skiing for me equals about four days of recovery. Oh, no kidding. Oh, so. uh, yeah, don't go get hurt then. But uh, yeah, I'll be happy to get out of the eighty-something degree hot, humid Houston weather to get up in there. But uh, well, good. Thanks, Brandon. And I think with that, we'll go ahead and get started with the uh, the presentation. So like we said, today is going to be um, a series two, um, first technical uh, series of the year. We're going to focus on just kind of uh, gas lift 101. Um, it, down the line this year, we'll have a uh, more in-depth, a couple uh, more in-depth gas lift series. But really today, I want to just talk about the equipment, um, what a design looks like, the parameters that go into a design um, so that the uh, the operator can make sure that they get the drawdown they expect, the lift point that they want, and hopefully the longevity of the system uh, to defer any kind of workovers and things like that in the future. So, yep, with that, let's go ahead and get started. So, Brandon, one of the first things I, I like to talk about when it comes to, to gas lift is really what are we doing? Um, there's a lot of artificial lift out there. Um, different artificial lift methods have different ways of reducing that bottom hole pressure, getting that lower flow and bottom hole pressure to get that drawdown to maintain or increase production. And, and really, gas lift's no different than the other artificial lift types. And so really, for my end, I like to kind of just review what gas lift is, and more importantly, how are you achieving that drawdown uh, with gas lift? And so typically, in, in my thoughts, what I find is that gas lift is, is focused on density reduction. Um, you know, in my head, and it, it almost just mimics natural flow, right? Yeah, for sure. And that's something I always kind of stress or bring to a point is that it is a, the most natural form of artificial lift. Right? Mm -hmm. um, that we're supplying the well the energy that you know that needs to to flow mm -hmm. that it can't it can't provide on its own and like you said we're doing that you know through the introduction of a high pressure gas right and right. In, injecting on the well yeah so you're you're essentially supplementing the the gas that the formation either doesn't have capabilities or given up or hasn't achieved the drawdown to start getting those increases in GLR. So yeah, good point. And and like you said, we we achieve that through two things: the high pressure gas, typically provided by a compressor, right? And then that introduction of the gas through the gas lift valve, that pressure regulator. And so we'll look into that. And um, you know, the nice thing with that too is your production rates can can really vary, right? Um, you know, what do you produce a Barnett shell gas lift system at? Maybe 100 le barrels per day or less? Yeah, depleted, older depleted well for mm -hmm. sure. Maybe, you know, maybe even less than that. And, and obviously the design concept or biases that you use in like in a lower pressure well like that or, or a versus a newer well is, mm -hmm. you know, obviously uh, quite different. So, right, right. Um, but, but absolutely. Um, Wide range of fluid rates, uh, wide range of static bottom hole pressures. Obviously, uh, the more bottom hole pressure well has, right, the, the better it does on a gas lift. That's one thing you, oh, yeah. you definitely got to have. But, um, but, but, yeah, we can we can uh, tackle a lot of different uh, design rates, um, well bore characteristics, etc. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's a good point. And so you can move a, a little bit of fluid up to, you know, a pretty high volume, depending on your flow areas and injection pressures and things like that. And uh, one thing I did uh, forget to mention is if you guys have any feedback, if you have any questions for Brandon uh, or myself, uh, feel free to throw that up in the chat section. Um, we got Robert back here helping us um, you know, moderate this this presentation. So if we have any questions, um, feel free to throw those up there, and we'll we'll stop the presentation, answer them, um, or we'll hold off to the end and uh, get Brandon. We'll give Brandon a couple quiz questions. Um, hopefully, no softball questions to to answer. Let's throw the hard stuff at them. Um, but but like we Brandon mentioned, you know, from the gas lift, really the whole purpose of gas lift or how gas lift works is just simple density reduction, right? We're taking a heavy fluid or heavier fluid from the formation. We're introducing that injection gas into that heavier fluid or higher density fluid. And through the introduction of that gas, we're reducing that density which then translates down to the end of tubing or the perforations to get that flow and bottom hole pressure. And, and one of the things we mentioned is, you know, we're simply just supplementing the gas that the reservoir may not have to per, to mimic or to continue that natural flow process. Yeah, for sure. Um, whenever I'm doing my, especially my field trainings, you know, um, try to, um, you know, Focus on the fact, you know, that the, the well standard four fluid, right? It can't flow on its own. That hydrostatic head, right, is a more overcoming the reservoir pressure. So um, we can create a di differential between the two, right? We can we can get the lower flow. Yeah, we can get that drawdown and get that production. And you know, ultimately, with that injection gas, we're increasing that total gas to liquid ratio. Or a lot of times, you guys will see it as your GLR, right? So by adding gas into the produced fluids and the formation gas. We're increasing that gas to liquid ratio, which of course is hopefully increasing those mixture velocities, overcoming the force of gravity to get those liquids up. And then ultimately, you know, reducing the flow and bottom hole pressure. So um, you bring up a good point in field trainings. I always like to mention that too, especially when you're comparing different artificial lift types, um, more so on like your pump side, your ESPs and your rod pumps and how they differ from that, they're still achieving the flow and bottom hole pressure reduction, but in different means than just density reduction in the gas lift. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so that helps you kind of pick your artificial lift based off your well types. Yes, sir. So yeah, great, great points. And so when we talk about the application of the gas lift, um, really, and, and tell you the truth, this should be the application of any kind of artificial lift, is there's always things to consider, right? There's some well types, and some formations that make sense to use gas lift. There's other formations that maybe ESP or rod pump would work better on. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I see a lot, Brandon, is is high volume, and, and that's high volume of liquids or gases, right? Is that if we need to move a large volume of fluid, we can look at some of the different art, uh, gas lift uh, applications. If we're dealing with high volumes of gas where maybe a pump doesn't work as well, um, then that's where I see like gas lift being a good application. Yeah, and we can sometimes influence the volume of the well, right? With like you said, the type of gas lift application mm -hmm. that we choose for that particular well, be it tubing flow or annular flow, uh, tubing sizes. Yeah, yeah, great point. And we'll touch on all that here in the next few slides. One of the other things that I see out there, Brandon, is temperature. Um, so really all artificial lift is affected by temperature, um, probably more so on the equipment, right, versus mm -hmm. the actual design or the application of it. Yeah, we'll we'll have to look at elastomers may even look at, you know, the metallurgies of the valve itself. Okay. Um, at, in, in, you know, particular instances, maybe we need to, uh, you know, we typically use a 3 ply Monell bellus maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to look at using ink and they'll. Oh, yeah, well, when you start certain. seeing those higher temperatures. Right. Yeah, typically over like that 250 degree Fahrenheit range, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah good point. And it mentions elastomers on there. You know, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of elastomers in a gas lift valve, right? But, um, but where they are, it's it it is kind of crucial to, uh, you know, the long term effect it can have on that valve. Um, just you know, be aware of your elastomers. Um. And, and always consider that prolonged exposure that uh, 
than the effect it may have over time when it's actually installed in the well. Yeah, that's a good point. So that you're you're increasing that life of the artificial lift system and hopefully deferring that pull um, if you you know are picking the right materials and elastomers. You know, other things that I like to look at and I get a lot of questions on is things like deviation. You know, we deal on a lot of these resource plays, highly deviated horizontal wells, and outside of a multi-phase flow standpoint, from the actual application of gas lift, deviation really doesn't have much of an effect, right? And so, you know, technically we could go to 90 degrees with a gas lift if we wanted to. Um, I think we'll talk about that a little bit in some of the application pipes where you don't necessarily have to go with a gas lift valve. Uh, to 90 degrees, but you can utilize, say, your end of tubing as a lift point down into those those um, higher deviation points. Yes, sir. So um, other things I like to talk about, you know, of course, when it comes to like sand and frag plug debris and solids, you know, picking your, your gas lift equipment correctly, hopefully to minimize any kind of sand or debris issues that could, um, you know, gum up or stick up the gas lift equipment. Um, I don't think we see it too much on the resource plays, but like low API oil, um, more so probably from like a paraffin standpoint, right, is that if you have a lot of paraffin issues with your produced oil, um, maybe consider some paraffin treatments and things like that. Uh, maybe plunger assisted gas lift to kind of combat that because that gas breakout does like to introduce uh, some paraffin buildup uh, in your flow path. And that kind of leads you into chemical too. We get that question a lot. Mm -hmm. How's chemical effect? Mm. your gas lift right. system or your application and uh you know the chemical companies that have come a long way since you know we started right they tend to you know trying to to uh consider that in in their chemical uh you know gas lift application type chemicals yeah so yeah that's a good um, point you know we don't see it so much anymore but i remember early on you know seeing you know a lot of chemical residue build up batch treatments maybe weren't uh you know, really necessarily catered toward what we were trying to do at that mm -hmm. point in time. It's, it's, it's definitely different now, for sure. Yeah, definitely. And I, I guess that kind of goes back to elastomers too, right? Mm -hmm. Making sure your elastomers can hold up to those chemicals if they're being introduced in the uh, injection stream. That's right. Yep, yep. Good points on that. So when we talk about the application, really want to move into the actual installation um, of that gas lift. And um, like Brandon mentioned with his experience and working in some of the different basins, you see a whole different type of applications, right? How do you actually install the equipment and what are the different install methods that you can run gas lift equipment on? Um, and, you know, from my end, I see a lot of conventional just tubing flow uh, where we inject gas down the tubing case and annulus through your gas lift valve and then produce everything up your um, production tubing. Um, but in my opinion, Brandon, one of the biggest things that limit us on conventional or tubing flow is typically our casing IDs. Yeah. Most of these resource plays, casing IDs are typically pretty small, uh, five and a half inch casing or smaller. So, you know, what do we do when we're having to deal with 3,000, 5,000, 8,000 barrels of fluid when we're constrained to maybe five and a half inch casing with two and seven eighths tubing? Yeah. Yeah, and you may look at, you know, your next point in those applications, annual flow gas lift, mm -hmm. or we're actually injecting down the tubing, flowing up the up the casing, right? Um, you know, we can do applications where we have basically both the casing and tubing flow uh, valves on on the on the same uh, tubing stream too. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but yeah, can consider you know what kind of fluid rates the operator expects to see, wants to see. Um, that kind of thing whenever we're really considering or, or choosing right whether we're going to go conventional flow or, or annual flow but but yeah me too for the most part you know see tubing flow conventional as your um, most common type applications yeah. like to feel like you know most operators are going to let the wells flow up casing you know get that get that free yeah free, free production yeah right. as long as they can yeah. and, and uh and then and then tube it up but uh but but you definitely see uh, you know, see both for sure. Okay, yeah, that that's a good point. And I think one of the other big questions we get asked a lot 
um, packer or packer less, right? Is you can run a production packer with your gas lift, but you don't necessarily have to. Uh, maybe outside of like pressure control as a barrier. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, talk about a little bit of the benefits of maybe running a packerless system versus a, a packer mm -hmm. gas lift system. Or what I mean by that open installation is packerless, semi closed is your, your packered application. Right. And, and yeah, you know, early on, wells, you know, got a lot of pressure. You see that packer in a lot of times solely for well control. Elon well, set a packer, yeah. um, latch on and, and then, and then, you know, move forward from there. Um, as well as get older and more depleted, um, you know, maybe that gas lift string is there for just to unload the well, mm -hmm. you know, just a, a, a small, you know, few, three, four valve system. Um, and then needs to go on gaffle. So, you know, you know, I, I feel like if you see plunger lift in your future, maybe uh, a packerless Consider that an open installation of packer. Correct. Yeah, so you can utilize that tube in case an annual. Yeah, you got the angler volume yeah. to help drive your thing. And let's take a look and see what those look like. So what Brandon's talking about is uh, over here on our left, our tubing flow, where injection gas is red, our produced fluids are in blue. So we're injecting down that tube in case an annulus. You can have a packer, like Brandon mentioned, maybe if you plan to switch artificial lift methods, um, removing that packer and going packerless. And, and like he talked about from an annular flow, it's basically just the reverse of tubing flow, right? We're now injecting gas down the production tubing, flowing up that tubing case in annulus. And, and what we're doing, right, Brandon, is we're utilizing uh, that larger cross-sectional area a bigger flow area to handle those higher production rates. Yes, sir. Yeah, and and you know you may or may not use a packer on an annular flow system too. Mm -hmm. We definitely have have seen both. Um, but you know you mentioned uh, ESP catchers actually yeah. being ran on some operators looking at at that as an option now too. Yeah, and that's a pretty neat application. That's been relatively new. Um, where it's essentially a, a frack plug almost, or a composite bridge plug more so, and the operator uses it from that that pressure barrier isolation, um, but then can set that deeper into the inclination, say like over an arrow set one, mm -hmm. um, and then land the tube in above it. And then when they're ready to switch, they can either go and mill out that, that ESP catcher, or if they can set it deep enough, just land a, a gas lift system above it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's been pretty neat. Uh, something new for for everybody to really learn. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when we go from application, um, really want to go into the equipment, right? What is a gas lift valve? More so, how does it work? Um, and, and the types that you can pick from. And and really, the the two common sizes you see out there uh, is a one inch and an inch and a half OD valve. And, and from my opinion, the things that really dictate that is that tube encasing combination, right? What right. can you fit in the well? Yeah, yeah, and you know, the valve just a down low pressure regulator, right? But um, for sure, um, consider that size. We, I think, cross the industry, we try to run an inch and a half valve when we can. The run. bigger valve when we can, yeah. yeah. Um, comes off seat a little easier because of the larger area. Mm -hmm. um, a little better flow rate right, through the valve. Get, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so um, not to say there's anything wrong with one inch valves. We run a lot of one inch valves. Yeah, we sure do. Um, especially like you mentioned earlier, uh, when we're confined to you know, like two and seven eighths tubing and five and a half inch casing, we can't run an inch and a half valves. So, yeah. so we're running one inch valve. Yeah, good um, point. And um, you know, with those valves, you can find them in two different types: wireline retrievable over here on the uh, the left, and more so your tubing or your conventional um, gas lift valve on the right. And I think typically from the resource plays, we see more of this style run where it's a, uh, a tube and retrievable, mm -hmm. uh, tube and deployed uh, gas lift valve. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And let's look at how those valves work, both um, wireline and retrievable. And one of the things, Brandon, you mentioned is one inch versus inch and a half. The application uh, of the system is the same, right? And conventional versus wireline retrieval is very similar, is you have a, a area up here called our dome that we charge with nitrogen. That acts as the opening and closing force 
on the bellows or the spring that you mentioned, Brandon. And so both conventional and wireline have the same mechanics. They're just essentially packaged a little different for their application, right? Yeah. Um, you know, you'll notice that on a wireline retrievable, the valve and the, and the check are, are integral. It's all, all yeah, one good piece. Good point. Valve um, up here but, and check down here. Yeah, but as yeah. far as the valve itself, yeah, operates essentially the same. Um, you got your tail plug assembly there with the trainer valve where we add or remove uh, pressure. You know, mm -hmm. set the valve to whatever the, the set pressure the design calls for. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, and, and then, and then you have your bellus, uh, your stem, and your seat. So, mm -hmm. yeah, your pressure right acts on on the bellus, pull, pushes that valve off seat. And um, that stem and seat's what controls or regulates that gas flow, right? Sure. So you sure. can you want to pick your your stem and seat assembly based off of the kind of expected gas volumes you need. Yes. L high gas volumes, larger stem and seat. Lower gas volumes, smaller stem and seat, right? Right. Yeah, and, and definitely consider that, right? You have to think um, over the years, I've, I've come across people that kind of want to consider port sizes based on tubing size. But I think you need to look at the parameters of the well mm -hmm. and how much injection volume gas you're going to need um, to, you know, optimize that well um, in the future yeah. and base them off that. That's a good point. So something that uh, as a uh, operator, that's what they want to talk to their vendors about is picking that port size based off of the achievable gas volumes mm -hmm. they can get out on wells. Yep. And one thing you pointed out too was the uh, the check valve assembly. If I can get it to go. There we go. Um, so you mentioned that on your wireline retrieval, that's all one integrated piece, right? Whereas with a conventional, it's a separate um, box by pin connection that you essentially thread into the gas lip valve and then back down into the mandrel here. And I think I have a better picture of it um, over here. Um, so your check valve. So, um, you know, one thing that I, I get question asked every once in a while is, do all gas lip equipment come with a, uh, a check valve? And the uh, answer is hopefully yes, yeah. right? Um, because this acts as your barrier, right? It allows flow from your injection side here to pass through into your production side down here. Mm -hmm. Let's say offset frack, or uh, I'm trying mm -hmm. to think of other reasons when that, that check would essentially go on seat, yeah. sealing off that production fluid. Um, if you're, you know, one thing to kind of tie that to consider is, is the pressure rating of that check valve, right? You need to, consider the depth of the well and then mm -hmm. any kind of future application so I, i've actually had um some customers that uh if they foresee you know them doing any kind of pumping off pumping acid down the tubing at a high volume or whatever uh in the future they may want to go with a, a higher rated check by that i'm saying you know standard check valve is a 5k check right okay and that's 5,000 pound differential yes 5k differential okay pressure. across the start um, and, but you can also get a seven and a half k or 10k check mm -hmm. too um you know like in southern oklahoma really in the really deep you know woodford area down there we'll we'll run a we'll look at sometimes consider running uh seven and a half k checks or 10k checks mm -hmm. um i know um, out in the Delaware, we've had to do some of that as well, uh, just because the bottom hole pressure is so high. Initially. Yeah, that makes sense. And I've seen it too in the Eagleford with offset frack interference. That yeah. that uh, pressure when the well offset well gets hit by a frack, that it does exceed that 5,000 psi pressure differential, especially on like depleted wells. So some operators will run 10,000 psi mm -hmm. uh, pressure rated checks yeah. and. And I got a little schematic here that shows that, Brandon. So that check valve threads into the mandrel. So then you can get that 5,000 or 10,000 PSI yeah. pressure differential between your production tubing and your tubing case and annulus, right? And that gets hydro tested right before it goes in the in the ground. And mm -hmm. a lot of times it gets checked again in the field if we're hydro testing tubing. True, so yeah. We get asked that question a lot too. Can you, you know, can you hydro test these? Um, and absolutely. Yeah, you can run your hydro testing tool across mm -hmm. this, and when they pressure test the tubing, they're checking that mm -hmm. that connection as well. Good point. And and here's our gas lip valve that threads into the check, which then threads in the mandrel, like Brandon had mentioned. And for wireline operations, a little different mandrel configuration, right? A lot larger mandrel has a bigger ID, and we'll touch on this in more details. But it allows for that valve 
uh, if I can get my animations work, there we go, to essentially wireline uh, or slick line set and retrieve. So if an operator needs to change the design, they can go in with slick line and pull that versus having to trip this whole system out with a, with a work over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they can run a kick over tool, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, that's right, pull that thing out. So when we look at the mandrel itself, that becomes the housing for that, that, that check valve and, and gas lip valve. Um, and one of the things we talked about is, is valve selection. And Brandon mentioned that, you know, it's really a configuration of your tubing size and your casing size. And so ideally we wanna try to run that inch and a half valve where we can, um, but you guys can see here that we're gonna have some limitations based off of like our casing size and weight. So what's the kind of a common uh, tubing configuration you see, say in like West Texas, Permian or Delaware Basin? Yeah, probably more two and seven eighths with one inch valves. Yeah. You know, wells I work on out there for the most part are five and a half inch casing. Mm -hmm. So um, got to really you know, like two and seven eighths, you'll have to get into your to your seven inch casing range, right? To run an inch and a half they valve. Fit that bigger valve. Yeah, on two yeah. and seven eighths mandrel. So. Yeah, good point. And so maybe that argues benefits of uh, running bigger casing strings on your wells. Yeah. <laughs> so, and this is what you see as a conventional gas lift mandrel. Production threads into the top here, um, threads into the bottom here, and everything's deployed via workover rig. Typically, I mean, a drilling rig can do it, but 90% of the time it's a workover rig running that so if you ever need to change this equipment out have to get a rig pull your tubing unthread those mandrels and you know essentially thread a replacement into it right yeah. um, one of the other types that we see um, is your side pockets and and more so i guess your different applications from like uh, annular flow and one thing we didn't talk about brandon is this is going to be typically used for uh conventional tubing flow right yes. injection on the outside production on the inside but if we get into say annular flow systems you know what mandrel options are there if we need to reverse that flow inject down the production tubing flow up that tubing case and annulus yeah you got an im mandrel there inner mandrel right mm -hmm. you know valves mounted internally um inside of the tubing you inject down the tubing um, and then flow flow the casing right there so, here. Yeah. Um, good thing about that style mandrel right is we can run a inch and a half valve. No matter what the casing yeah. size is. Yeah. And that's important sometimes with annular flow right because you may need to inject more gas mm -hmm. and would obviously on a on a tubing flow type application. So so uh, you know we got more gas higher gas passage rate um, through an inch and a half. Because valve. you can put that bigger valve. Right. In. Yeah. That makes sense. Right. So when you get into your larger port sizes, you get a little better valve stability too, right? So, um, so, so that's you know, an advantage to the disadvantage obviously is, you know, it's inside the tube. Mm -hmm. So, so no through tube and access, yeah, right? Yeah. And it looks like we got a question, Robert. Yeah, Eric Garner asks, what do you typically see in the Appalachian Basin on wet gas flows for tubing and valve sizing? Oh, great question. So uh, often like Marcellus, Utica. Um, West Virginia, Ohio, Pennsylvania. That's a great point. I'll kick that over to Brandon. What do you yeah. typically see from gas lift? Um, you know, most of the wells I'm working on in that area um, are got the gas lift application early early on. They're, they're snowmoring gas lift valves, right? Tube and flow wells flowing. Um, so they're running a, a conventional style man, right? But yeah. you know, with that being said you know, those wells are so high energy uh, for the most part up there. I, I don't feel like a ton of gas lift really gets ran mm -hmm. in that part of the world. Usually using it for like deliquefaction, right. dewatering early on, yes, and then bring that well to natural. Yeah, you've got, you've got some areas up there where, you know, they're starting to get into a little wetter area. Um, but, uh, but yeah, those are really high GLR wells. Mm -hmm. um, so um the ones we are gas lifting you know essentially uh have kickoff strings that have unloading strings in them right we're we're trying we're trying to forecast when that well's going to actually need gas lift so you're predicting yeah. a future liquid loading right. and then want to use the gas lift for that right. that yeah. makes sense yeah. which is you know 
the, the wells that I personally work on, you know, looking at a few hundred barrels, mm -hmm. um, and they're still got a pretty good gas drive. Yeah. So, um, typically so, two and three eighths or two and seven eighths, too, man. Um, some of both, um, I'd say probably 50 50. Okay, between two and three eighths and two and seven eighths. Yeah, no, that, that's a good point. That was a great question. Thank you for that. Um, one of the other mandrel types that, that we talked about is your side pocket mandrel uh, with your wireline retrieval valve. And so the, the you know benefit to this is, again, the mandrel itself is deployed via your workover rig, production threads into the top here, to the bottom here. But if you ever need to change this valve out uh, due to the configuration of the mandrel and the fact that you can see the valves installed internally of the, 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 the mandrel, you can come in with slick line and a kickover tool and essentially pluck that that valve out of pocket and change that valve out. Um, from a full string of these, we typically don't see a lot of that, uh, mainly due to the nature of unconventionals, right? Rapidly yeah. declining. Um, but I see a lot of these applications where maybe the bottom one or bottom few mandrels have side pockets. So when they get down to that lower production rate, you can still reconfigure your design. Right, yeah. Um, we would utilize them in our pilot valve systems too. Yep, good point for um, like intermitting and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. But, but yeah, the, always the side pocket mandrels are used offshore, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's where- That's their main application. Yeah, yeah. their big advantage, obviously, to the limitations of, uh, you know, being able to go work over rig out there, obviously, mm -hmm. but you're also dealing with higher PI wells um in that part of the world too so um but uh but yeah they're starting to see you know more and more consideration of using them uh you know in in the types of wells that we typically work on yeah yeah and, and you bring up a good point is that typically to get the benefit of a side pocket mandrel in terms of a full string you're going to focus more on your higher deliverability higher liquid producers maybe longer term um, liquid producers versus a rapidly declining mm -hmm. well. And then in that case, if you consider a side pocket, maybe as your, like your bottom valve, so you can change that artificial lift type. Almost like you mentioned with packer versus packerless, is that looking into the future, kind of predicting your life cycle of artificial lift, and that's mm -hmm. where this side pocket mandrel can come into play. Yeah, great points, Brandon. So Brandon, I want to change gears on you a little bit. We talked about the application. We talked about the equipment. Um, here, I want to get more into the operating considerations and the design. Mm -hmm. What needs to go into it? What are kind of our parameters to, you know, essentially set up a gasless system? One, to make sure it works when you need it, right? Uh, and two, make sure it works long term to get that that further deepening of your injection point and kind of continue that drive to a lower flow and bottom hole pressure. And of course, you brought it up at the very beginning, the thing that drives gas lift is that injection pressure, right? Um, and so typically I look at it as 100 to 140 PSI per thousand foot of well depth in terms of your needed compression. Um, you can go over that, right? Yeah. And then, you know, that falls pretty well in line with what we typically see, right? 1,000, 1,200 pounds of kickoff mm -hmm. pressure typically. Um, but you don't want to limit yourself. Um, think we saw you know some challenges in in that in that space uh recently just due to supply and uh you know chain issues and mm -hmm. compressor oh, availability and that kind of thing yeah. but uh but yeah don't don't limit yourself and by that i mean you know don't don't bring a seven or eight hundred pound <laughs> in, <laughs> on a 10, compressor out on a ten thousand foot well and and then you know because that's going to limit the amount of drawdown that we can get on the well and you know especially if it's a if it's a, a, a you know a, a high water cut well mm -hmm. you know a really high you know water type reservoir you know we're getting the well unloaded is, is uh, really crucial to the mm -hmm. performance and and in situations where you know you don't have a lot of formation gas to work with as well so, yeah um, and i guess that goes into like what you see with that single point high pressure gas lift right is that yeah. they've kind of thrown that rule out the window and may use 500 pounds per thousand feet yeah. right and so you can essentially do the same thing but you're lifting from your deepest point you're into tubing mm -hmm. right off the beginning yeah 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 
And other things I like to look at too, outside of the compression, of course, you know, picking your injection gas volume, you mentioned picking your volumes based off your port size or how much the system needs. Mm -hmm. So that's a big piece is that you don't want to over inject because then you cause that frictional pressure loss, but more so you don't want to under inject, which is going to lead to a higher flow and bottom hole pressure. And then ultimately, you know, less production mm -hmm. than you want out of the well. Yeah. And, and don't assume either that excessive gas injection uh, can supplement lack of injection pressure, right? <laughs> um, and I didn't think about that. So you're saying that if you have really low injection pressure but high volume, mm -hmm. that doesn't equate to yeah. having the adequate or the correct amount of injection pressure? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. great point. That, I never thought right, about that. Injection pressure is going to influence your point of injection. Obviously, your volume is – is is gonna I, I say affect the performance the optimization of that point of injection mm -hmm. right um so you know you gotta have a good balance of both yeah yeah great point and then of course little things like lower your well head pressures at surface any kind of back pressures that you got to flow against well let's look at a couple things in terms of you know these considerations along with uh your mandrel spacing um, to, to really look at what a gas lift design, um, you know, would look like, right, from identifying injection point and things like that. So let me jump to here. And so I like to look at this slide really to define the types of equipment um, or more the, the use of the equipment, right, is that um, typically you're going to have a bracket of unloading mandrels and then a secondary segment of operating mandrels. And, and kind of like the name implies, those unloading mandrels usually are going to be pretty wide spaced, um, and all they're doing is mimicking injection pressure over production pressure differential to get us down to our you know long term or ideal lift yeah. point. Um, and those are there just to displace that hydrostatic fluid, right? Um, are there ever applications where you might not need unloading mandrels? Yeah, for sure. Um, depleted wells and can't sustain a high fluid level so you're saying that yeah. reservoir pressure can't hold fluid level up to surface right you know and that's one way you know you can really optimize your your uh gas lift design gas lift system um and obviously save money too mm -hmm. um, by cutting out those upper right. upper valves yeah yes, sir. yeah good point and you know one of the big pieces that we look at from gas lift systems more importantly to these operating mandrels these uh, fixed segmented mandrels, you know, one, of course, to get your initial lift depth, and then two, to plan for any kind of future decline as your well ages out. And one of the things that we see, too, um, is what really helps determine that bracket spacing. Do you have to use the same bracket spacing for every well and every basin, no matter the considerations, or can you adjust that operating yeah. mandrel spacing and really, what kind of feedback do you need to make those adjustments? Yeah. Well, I think to answer your question, I think at one point in time, we thought we did need to make them yep. all the same. I, I agree with you on that. And uh, over the years, we found out it really wasn't the case and that uh, the formation you are has a really big influence on it. I personally, I think I kind of figured that out by accident, just mm -hmm. uh, working with operators in really deep wells that had a, uh, you know, had a high formation GLR. And, uh, you know, hey, let's try it. Let's try, you know, branching out. Let's get out of that 500-foot standard and see if we can get away with seven or 800-foot spacings. And, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it worked. So, um, you know, it's definitely, uh, you know, it, it, it definitely helps. It, it, I think, is a great way to optimize your your system to to definitely consider that, you know, a uh, uh, like, like you know, when we used to work in the Mississippi Lime, right, we were – Got trying to gas lift up there. We had the tighter spacings uh, early on the Barnett. We kind of, you know, I remember one time we tried to deviate from a 500 foot spacing and, and kind of got in a bind on a few wells. So we figured out, you know, due to due to the high water cuts um, in those wells, we needed to 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 tighten it back up and and then uh, you know look at looking like in the in the in the scoop stack or really any other formation that that has a high formation GLR, you know, you can look at, uh, you know, getting into your wider spaces in your operating zone. Yeah, that makes sense. And so that formation GLR, as that ratio increases, 
your mandrel spacing or your minimum mandrel spacing should increase as well. And so, yeah, that's a good point is that looking at your formation GLR is really going to help dictate your minimum mandrel spacing. And then to add to that, too, we also see as your, your gradients change, mm -hmm. that can have effect on it, meaning that maybe early on in the unloading, you're going to be unloading a relatively heavy gradient. But as that formation uh, contribution comes in, as your water cuts change, your gradients change as well, which can help further extend that distance between mandrels. Yeah, and as yeah. we work in a, you know, certain formations and gather that data, you know, we can definitely apply that knowledge, right? Yeah, yeah, great point. And so uh, definitely something to look at. And, and again, this piece here, this is the design, right? This is the pre-engineering work before it gets put in the ground, and it helps us predict our flow and bottom hole pressure, of course, our total number of mandrels, and, and more so helps us really fine-tune that operating bracketing spacing uh, even before the equipment gets installed in the ground. Mm -hmm. So that the idea is that once you put this system in, it'll initially unload the well and then keep that production going as well ages. Yes, sir, Robert. Um, John Gon is asking that top x-axis, is that your injection or valve open pressure? Uh, it seems a little bit higher for normal pressure application. Uh, great, great point. So uh, talking about this pressure range up here, that's going to be your injection pressure. So, of course, this is uh, pressure versus depth, right? So uh, here we have a 1,200-pound system as our kickoff pressure. And this black line here represents our gas weight or gas column pressure as we get deeper into the well. So this is going to be our injection pressure, uh, both at surface and at depth. But but it's a good point. This doesn't represent our actual surface opening and closing pressures, yeah. just simply our, our pressure profile as we get deeper into the well. Yeah. And the further on, you know, you can see, you know, I, I can't I can't read that from here. But <laughs> Sorry, you can see where the different where where the equalization is the point of equalization between the, point the casing yeah. and the tubing. That would right be your, that would be your your deepest potential point of injection mm -hmm. at that designed uh, fluid rate. Yep. So you see the legend at the bottom there, whatever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> whatever. That's it's the bigger for the yeah, other yeah. user. Um, the other small screen. Yeah, there. That's that's the designed fluid rate, right? That's yep. what we expect the well to do. Uh, may do better hopefully does better than that um uh, you know so um but 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 yeah you can see there where your point of injection will be yeah great point good questions guys um and, and so we talked about you know you work on the design you pick the mandrel spacing uh like brandon mentioned you identify your lift depth and your equalization point and then really from there what do you do after the system is installed right you have to turn on your injection gas. You have to displace those fluids. Um, and, and really, it's important to kind of follow through that what we call unloading or kickoff procedure. And actually, I think, Brandon, we have a little video um, that shows that. I'll jump to that next slide. Mm -hmm. uh, but more importantly, you know, the big thing we can control from surface is that injection volume. Yeah. Those valves, like you mentioned, are pressure regulators, so they're going to already have their set opening and closing pressures. And so we can't control the pressure, but what we can do is adjust that injection volume to get the pressure yeah. that we need in the system. And we want to do that right when we're kicking off the wall so we don't damage the system, so um, we don't you know, evacuate that fluid through the valve at a, at a really high rate, high enough that it damages yeah, where you get that actual original damage, yeah. Right. And typically, I try to target about a barrel uh, per minute or less right. from that displacement side, yeah. And you get a good point. And I'll go to this, Brandon. We can kind of talk about uh, this little animation that goes over that kickoff procedure, that, that unloading of the system. So we'll let this uh, – there we go. So um, what we have is uh, – a well, right? Like Brandon mentioned, it's full of fluid in both the production tubing and the tube encasing annulus. And this is an example of a conventional or tubing flow. We're, mm -hmm. we're going to apply injection gas to the tube encasing annulus. First, like you mentioned, Brandon, we need to displace that fluid represented in blue 
through our gas slip valves and then eventually get injection gas. Yeah. And so we have um, our casing pressure in, um, in yellow, I guess, and our production tubing mm -hmm. pressure in green. So I'll let this play and, and kind of talk over it, right? So yeah, it's during this time, right, where we've got that procedure that we want to try to follow or specify kickoff procedure. As you can see right now, you're just displacing fluid mm -hmm. right through through your valve. And we can identify that by our pressure build and our casing, right? Mm -hmm. That we're just controlling the volume and it's trying to displace that fluid out of the tube and casing annulus until it reaches that first gas slip valve. And that's when we actually start getting our density reduction, right? Mm -hmm. Once we get injection into that first gas slip valve. Yeah, and you ought to see a you know, kick a gas, slug a gas, come to surface. Yep, right so, here right. in our tubing. Yeah, in your tubing pressure. And as we transfer down too, we should start to see a reduction in our injection pressure, right? As we move from one gas slip valve to the next one deeper into the system. Yeah, and that's the, you know, the pressure drop that we'll take between between our valves, right? Um, I don't know if we really hit on it or not, but obviously the casing pressure should injection pressure i shouldn't say case of pressure if it's annular flow system not yeah. tubing pressure but your injection pressure will give you an indication of what valve you're actually injecting and that's this point right here where we see that drop what is that drop between valves typically what do you prefer i mean I, usually you'll see around 25 pounds you know 25 psi. you know 20 to 30 depending on mm -hmm. you know the application uh and that's going to be at your surface, your surface injection pressure. Right. Yep. And as we continue to transfer, and one thing that Brandon mentioned too, as we reduce that injection pressure, that allows those upper pressure regulators to essentially regulate flows, right? They're sensing that change in casing pressure. They're closing, redirecting that gas through one single lift point um, and preventing gas from migrating through these upper pressure regulators or gas slip valves um, since they're closed. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, great point. So uh, guys, with that, want to touch on on one more thing and then uh, we'll jump into to Q&A. Um, so uh, again, first uh, technical series uh, of the year, Gas Slip 101 with the things to help uh, with Brandon Dobbs. Um, other things that we're gonna talk about throughout the year um, we'll dive into some gas lift troubleshooting optimization next to kind of continue that that gas lift piece. Um, and really with a continuation of that, uh, spend some time in May on nodal analysis, utilizing that nodal analysis to pick our flow areas, our mm -hmm. injection volumes to help further optimize the gas lift system. Mm -hmm. And then some of the other things we'll talk about, plunger lift, um, cap tubing, downhole gauges with artificial lift, and then kind of wrap up the year with some more plunger uh, and plunger assisted gas lift applications. Yeah, that should, that should all be good. Yeah, definitely. So with that, guys, um, we'll stop sharing the presentation and uh, jump into some Q&A uh, for anybody. So, uh, Brandon, some of the questions that, that we've seen um, come across were, you know, from equipment standpoint, what kind of production rates help determine, um, say, like uh, your tubing size or if you go from conventional to, to annular flow? You know, what are the things that um, an operator would say, hey, we might need to not use tubing flow initially. Maybe we need to go to annular flow. Um, can you clarify some of those parameters? Yeah, I would say, I mean, if you're getting into what, the, over a couple thousand barrels a day on like a two and seven eighths type mm -hmm. application, it might be a consideration. Um, okay. You, you know, we've seen uh, wells make eight or nine thousand barrels of fluid on mm -hmm. annular flow. Obviously, you know, that's, you know, you don't want to do that up to me, right? You're going to, going to restrict, but. You know, you touched on some of the training. You mentioned nodal analysis, you know, and that's something too that maybe where you can consider uh, looking at it from that aspect too. We can take a look at those different flow areas and see what the what the benefits are 
of, of going to annular flow uh, compared to tubing flow. Okay. Yeah. So look at that. Utilize that nodal analysis. Um, one of the things I'd like to add to that too is say an operator is uh, casing flow in their well, um, but then the well starting to load up during casing flow yeah. and then that gap between what it can handle at casing versus tubing like you mentioned might be a good consideration for annular flow um one of the other questions we we have is um uh okay so we talked about more of the corrosion and the paraffin mitigation is can you use um a chemical injection mandrel and cap tubing with gas left or is it better to inject your chemical with your injection gas and i guess really what's the drawbacks or benefits of of either well obviously with the cap stream you know where it's going right meaning that it's going to like your deepest point. right yeah. yeah it's it's getting you know full treatment of the of the tubing stream mm -hmm. um i mean if, if you want to inject chemical down the backside, you can obviously do that but it's only going to get to your point of injection so so wherever that injection production is equalized that's the length of tubing that you're essentially going to treat correct yeah yeah and the man maybe that's good enough maybe that's you know um what what they want to accomplish but if you know you want to get it to the deepest point get the full treatment mm -hmm. um you know the cap injection stream with the with the injection mandrel um is you know a better option i think yeah and you can do that for both either tubing or annular flow, I guess. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, and you can do, you know, internal as well or externally banded. Um, you know, we've worked on some projects lately where we're doing an internal uh, capillary injection tube. So. Okay. Yeah, down the production tube. And yes, sir. Yeah. Good point. So one of the other questions I had, it came down to your packer versus packerless. So if you go to a packerless application, um, I guess, how do you determine like where you set your end of tubing and can you use that end of tubing as a, you know, your deepest lift point, almost like a gas lift valve or orifice valve? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think most stuff I'll work on, I, I typically look at trying to set that tubing in a tubing around 65, maybe 70 degrees. Okay. Down into um, the curve. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we obviously, you know, we, as Floco, we do a lot of plunger lift too. So, you know, you get some feedback from those guys too on where they like to set it as well. Um, you know, in, in particularly whatever area you're working in, right? But, uh, but yeah, that's, you know, kind of the range that I'm typically aiming for. Mm -hmm. And uh, is it landed above the perforations in a packerless system or do you ever run tubing down into the perfs? Yeah, I mean, sometimes we'll run. Yeah. If you got it, you know, if for whatever reason they put perfs is on and came in reperfed it up high okay and, um but uh but typically you're landing it above above your above, set of above the yeah first set of perfs but uh there's deviations from that sometimes yeah yeah good point well guys i, I think that was it and uh want to thank brandon for for joining today and and going over uh gas lift with us and mm -hmm. um of course if you have any other questions let us know um, we'll get this recorded and, and posted out there for anybody that missed or maybe had to leave early, um, things like that. But yep. other than that, Brandon, thank you, and uh, we thank look you. forward to future trainings. Yeah, thanks for having me, Matt. Appreciate yeah, definitely. It.